And just as he was about to bring that knife down to kill his son because he was acting in obedience, and as, as he brought that knife down, the angel stopped him, and the angel would have said something to him, Abraham, you don't have to sacrifice your son. And he would have said, yes, I do. God has told me I'm to kill your kid. I need to kill my kid. He said, no, you don't, because now God knows that he is first in your life. You see, wrapped up in that kid, wrapped up in Isaac, was every dream, every vision that he had for his life, every promise of God was wrapped up in that kid. And God said, kill your vision, kill your purpose, because I need to be number one. The problem is we have so many other things that we like to worship. But God has set the bar for us people very high when he said, serve him and serve him alone. That's not because God is an ego, it's because he's God that he's able to say that. And so worship for us is really, just as we say, just an appropriate response to a seeing God for who he really is. Now, it is written, it's an interesting sentence, three words. It means what? It means God's will and God's way is the it. It equals God's will and God's way. The fact that it says is, it means it's already done. There are no additions to it. There are no subtractions to it. It is already done. It's an issue of timing, is the is word. It says you don't have to add to it. There's no new revelation coming. There's no other word that you can add to this word. It is already written. And then the fact that it is written is interesting. Because you know this the sentence that says, the blankest pencil is better than the best memory. You notice that it is written because we have short memories. And we forget what has been done, we forget what has been said. But when it is written, it's in black and white and we can refer back to it. So God says, because you have so, such short memories, because you're just mere human beings, I'm going to write this stuff down so you don't mess it up. You don't confuse this with some urban legend out there. When it is written, the law of God and the love of God, as we've spoken about in this incredible book, people, it is written, it cannot be changed, it's a blueprint for everything on God's mind. Now I have a whole bunch of things, and I'm going to try and do as many as I can. I have 10, but I may not get to all 10 in the next uh, 45 minutes, because you're going to have a long day today. Okay, let me suggest a few things about this kind of authentic worship. This kind of worship can change your life. You know, you can't experience what you've not experienced, and and leave the same person. Well, I guess you can, because I see people doing that all the time. Or they will see the greatness of God, the wonder of God, and they will maybe show some emotion, and then walk out the door exactly as they were. It's not designed for that. Worship in the broader context could change your entire life, because you're standing on holy ground. Exodus 3, we have Moses, burning bush. The revelation of who God is as God speaks to him through the burning bush. We see Moses responding to God in worship, takes off his shoes, he bows low on his face because he has seen and he has heard from God. In Matthew chapter 27, we have the centurion at the crucifixion of Jesus. He watched Jesus die. He saw as they took this perfect human being who had done nothing wrong other than offend the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those guys. And he watched as they put nails in his hand and they put a crown of thorn on his head and they killed him. He watched that. And then he read the sign above the, on the cross and he, he said, the sign said, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And when he first read the sign, he said, yeah, right. But when he saw Jesus die, he realized who he was. And we see a beautiful cry of worship coming out of the mouth of this hardened centurion Someone who had witnessed many deaths, probably killed a bunch of people himself, and he cries out, Shut me, shut me, this is the Son of God. That is authentic worship, and those words that came out, Surely this is the Son of God, I've seen him, I know, I've watched, I've read his side, I know he is who the Son says he is. He cannot help himself, but other <coughs> words, Surely this is the Son of God. Worship can change your life. That man was never the same again. Moses was never the same after the burning bush worship experience. The second thing, worship is. I want to suggest to you that if you don't worship God, because there are other things you can worship, but if you don't worship God, your faith 
is going to shrink. I don't know, if you, you know, when you experience the worship of what you guys have just done, that beautiful aspect of verbal, musical worship, don't you walk out of here feeling stronger? If you deprive yourself of that, something in your soul shrinks. When you worship with all the passion in your heart, telling God how awesome he is, how great he is, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like faith talk. You know, your faith is a living thing. It's going to be fed. Breakfast, lunch, and supper. It's a living thing. It's not a dormant thing, or it could be, but it shouldn't be. Certainly, you know, that faith is a living thing. It needs to be fed. It needs to be exercised. And one of the ways that we strengthen our faith is through faith talk. And that's what happens in worship. When we declare, how great thou art. You know, we declare these amazing truths of who God is. And as I sing those songs and as I declare those great things about God, something happens in my soul that strengthens my faith and my resolve. In a practical way, I don't know if you've seen the power of worship music in your home. Music changes the atmosphere, if you've noticed that. And when you're in a bad mood or things are not going well, put on a few of those beautiful worship songs that you've just done right now. And watch the atmosphere change. You hear God so much clearer in the context of worship. Remember Elisha? Elisha was told by the king, three kings came to Elisha, and they said to Elisha, we're in trouble. We need to hear from you as to what God wants us to do. And they're desperate. They're wandering through the wilderness, through the desert of Edom. They've got no water. The enemy is out there. They're looking for him. But they cannot fight the enemy. They're just too weak. So they find Elisha. And they say, Elisha, why don't you tell God to tell us what to do? And so Elisha, the first thing he does is he says, call the harpist. And they say, what do you need a harpist for? What do you need music for right now? We need you to go to us God. He says, I hear God better in the context of worship. In worship, God has an ability to speak much more clearly to you than in the humdrum of life. Test it and see if that is exactly true. Faith talk is a great thing. Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20 had to practice faith talk. When God said to him, I want you to send your worship leaders out into battle and pray, you guys would be very nervous if you didn't battle first. He <laughs> <laughs> said, Are you mad? Well, you come first. The big enemy out there, it would be cannon fodder for them. You know? And you go to worship it, and when you go out to worship first, all of a sudden God gets so excited because of your worship, He does the job for you. And when the worship leaders go to there, it's followed by the army leaders of Adam and Fights. But the men went into that battle with great faith and because they were singing the songs of Zion, they were singing the songs that worship God. Kind of like, kind of like the national anthem before you play the game. When those guys stand up and there's tears coming in their eyes, you know, and they sing the national anthem. Something rises up within us, isn't it? That strengthens us for the battle that is just about to take place. That's what worship does. It enhances our faith and strengthens us through beautiful faith talk. The third thing that worship does, true worship is not dependent on your circumstances. True worship is not determined by your circumstances. You know, you, you, get, you get fair weather Christians, fair weather believers, who will worship like crazy when there's money in the bank, all the kids are going okay, Everything's secure and everything's nice, but take that away from them. I don't wish it so much anymore. Because they have fair weather believers. But the Bible is full of some great non fair weather believers who, who worship despite the circumstances. Love the story in Acts 16 of Paul and Silas. They're in prison, they've been beaten, their bodies are broken, they are bruised, and they are battered, and they are chained to a wall, and they're hungry. And they're thirsty and it's dark and it's cold. And there's big centurions standing around there looking very threateningly at them. And we were worried. There they were in the midst of those circumstances. Singing hymns. <laughs> singing hymns. In the midst of those things. I would have been phoning my lawyer very quickly. <laughs> but there they were. Singing hymns because worship for them was not determined by their circumstances. That's what makes Job such an intriguing personality. Job chapter 13 verse 15, and his wife is nailing him, 
So if you look at all these bad things that have happened, and you know that God, with God, bad things have happened to good people, and Job, you must be a really bad person because so many bad things are. Why don't you just curse God and die? Isn't his wife would have said this to him. His wife would say that. And Job says this, though they slay me, yet will I trust him. Though they slay me, yet will I continue to love him. Though they slay me, yet will I continue to worship him. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's great, man. To be able to worship under those circumstances. Number four, you can worship the wrong thing for the right reason. Have a look at the golden calf. God has done incredible things for him that he must. Open the Red Sea, give them water, admire it, and it was the time of thirst. God had met them on Mount Sinai, given them the law, and it says what they really needed. They knew they had to worship, because they had experienced so much of the goodness that they had of God. There were so many sons that said, We need to cry. We're crying out to worship something. Aaron Moses is no longer here. We have to worship something. We can't worship something we can't see. Aaron, will you just give us something that we can at least see and touch and hold it and measure and that we can see? Because if we want something we can see, we want to worship that. They were worshiping for the right reason, but they were worshiping the wrong thing. And that happens with us sometimes. Have a look at the Old Testament again, another example would be in the book of Exodus 32, we have the golden calf thing. And then we have the, the issue of the adders and the vipers and the snakes that came and bit the people because they were worshipping other gods. And then Moses really put up a bronze serpent in the middle and he said, guys, if you look at that, you're going to be healed. And they said, it can't be that easy. They said, it is. Moses said, it is that easy. Look at the snake, unfold and you will be healed. And they looked at the snake and they were healed. Man, that snake must be hugely significant. And they gave glory to the snake for the healing that they had received. And they began over the course of time worshipping legitimately for what their experience had been, but they were now worshipping and being corrupted and become distorted. And in Hezekiah, the king Hezekiah, 2 Kings chapter 18, the people were now worshipping the bronze serpent because they stupidly had distorted this whole thing away from the God who they couldn't have seen Jehovah to a stupid serpent. Hezekiah took one look at this and said, this is not right. So he took the serpent on the pole out from the archives that the people were worshipping and he crumbled into nothing. Because he said, you will never make anything in the image of God. Your worship is legitimate. Every one of us is crying out in our hearts to worship something for all the right reasons. Make sure that we haven't distorted this worship. I made a good list of some of the distortions that you could have. You know, when we worship the gift and not the giver, we're in problem. When we worship the blessing and not the blessor, we're in problem. When we worship the provision and not the provider, we have a problem. When we worship the healing and not the healer, we have a problem. When we worship creation, and not the Creator, we have a problem. When we worship comfort, and not the Comforter, we have a problem. When we worship, and I don't say this lightly, when we worship the book more than we worship God, we have a problem. Because this is a book. There will be no Bible in heaven, did you know it? This Bible is a tool for us on earth. And we, Baptists, need to understand this, because we love the book, we are people of the book. Far rather we were people of God and known as that. And nothing against being people of the book, that's wonderful, you should be there. But if the book is bigger to you than God, you're in trouble. Because it's a distortion. You know you have to worship. So this can become something that can become an idol to us. My church, I love my church with such a passion. But my church is not God. I love my family with such a passion. But my family is not God. I love my ministry more than anything in the world. I have the best job in the entire world. I was telling you when I was coming in. I don't think I could write a better job description for myself than the job I have right now. I bounce out of bed every single day so I can't wait for the day. I mean that. But if I'm not careful, that could become my God and I know could be sitting on the side watching me worship a replica of who he is. So be very careful about the distortion 
and, and, and. I guess at the end of the day, the end of the word determines who we should worship. If the word ends with er or or, giver, bless or, provider, he healer, creator or comforter, author of the book we worship, the author of what we worship the book, then I think we're on the right track. When we worship the item, you find yourself not long before you've distorted the beauty of what worship is about. Folks, I'm going to tell you, there are golden calves all around us. The church can become a golden calf. Your ministry can become a golden calf. Your family, the Bible, each one of them can be a distortion if you just not get what is good and as beautiful as each one of those things is. Number five, worship happens, here's an interesting one, when the secular becomes the sacred. You know, we, we tend to live as human beings in compartmentalized lives. I see businessmen who do bad business, and I say to them, you shouldn't be doing that. And they say to me, you don't understand. We don't confuse our spiritual life with our secular life. We don't confuse the sacred with the secular. Because you know how tough it is out there, and we have to sometimes break the rules or divert the tax man or do something like that. I'm saying you can't do that. Because true spirituality is only one, it's spiritual. And we separate the secular from the spiritual, and we think it's okay. Okay. Because the secular and the spiritual need to be one thing. And when the secular and the spiritual become one, that will be so much better to determine the blessing of God upon your lives. And you've got to work these things out. You know, we have this stupid terminology. We talk about schizophrenic Christians. Christians who live in these boxes and, and they become eccentric. An eccentric person is somebody who has many senses to different areas of his life or her life. Where if your life is made up of different aspects of your life, being circles, you know, when we have the areas of our lives are like this. Here's my family. Here's my business. Here's my church. Here's my hobbies. And there could be hundreds of these circles. Each one with a different center. That's eccentric living. That's why we're so many eccentric Christians. The Bible calls them double-minded people. They are unstable in all of their ways. But a Christian with a one center is a concentric Christian who is one center for everything. There's his hobbies, there's his church, there's his business, there's his family, and he only has one center who happens to be Jesus. Now, I remember, you know, I'm probably one of the oldest people in the room, but, but when we were kids, we used to have a tract called Four Spiritual Laws. Have you seen that thing? And it tells you that it's four laws of how you can become a believer. But then the last half of the brush is talking about a Christ-centered life. And there's a picture of a of two circles. There's a picture of two circles, like this. The one, and each one has a, a throne in the middle of it. This is the throne of your life. When you have got self on the throne, all the other areas of your life in, are in complete chaos all around you. But the moment you put Christ on the throne, according to this little diagram, it was beautiful. Because order is returned to your life. You see, when Christ is the king, he automatically brings order with him. That's why James speaks about double-minded Christians. He says he's unstable in all of his ways because he's he's eccentric. But Jesus is propounding here a concentric Christian experience where the secular is entwined in the sacred. And when the sacred becomes secular, the secular becomes sacred, Man, all of, a, all of a sudden, order is restored to life. I think you've heard the, the little story about these teenagers who, who, who decided to do something naughty one night and they, they broke into a big departmental store. Probably somewhere in America where they have these huge stores. They run for acres. And this bunch of kids broke into the shop one night. They just saw the system. They came down into the shop. And you would think they broke in there and steal some stuff. They didn't steal anything. All they did was change the price tags around. They took the price tag of that which was valuable and they put it for that which was not valuable. 
They took the price tag off the post post piece and they put it on the Porsche. They took the price tag off the, off the television screen and they put it on a, on a little suite or something like that. They just trashed the value system. They put the wrong value on the wrong thing. They went back there on the system. They came back the next day to see what would happen. <laughs> yeah, chaos broke out in that place. Absolute chaos. For the very reason that they corrupted the value system. You see, we have to have a value system in our lives. And the value system that is a corrupted one ends up like this. If you run it, it's in trouble. If God runs it, it's a whole bunch different. Now we have quite a lot of, I do quite a bit of counseling where I come from, and people come to me and, and I listen to their stories, and without being cynical or sarcastic, I, I hear stories of lives that Yes, I don't want to be over simplistic here, but the answer is very simple. Your life is in chaos because you put the wrong value on the wrong thing. And when you put the wrong value on the wrong thing, don't come and whine when your life becomes chaos around you. It's exactly the same thing. That's why David asked the Lord, he said, Lord, give me an undivided heart. I just want you. I want to be in your temple. The dream of my life is just to worship you. You forever. And watch how God used David to achieve and to do some of the greatest things. Not because David was any better than anybody else or more talented than anybody else. He just knew who the center of his life needed to be. So we need to make sure that worship happens when the secular becomes the sacred. Let's say add this one to this. Worship is a great tool for evangelism. In Acts chapter 3, we have the first apostolic miracle. Peter and John go into the temple and they see this crippled man who asked for, for money. And they say, there's sort of involved in my number, what I have I give you. And uh, this man jumps up and walking and leaping and praising God, you know the song. And the people around him, in verse 10, says, the people saw and were filled with awe and wonder. You see, when God does something in our lives, and it becomes evidence to the people around us, without saying a word, without preaching a sermon, all of a sudden, evangelism begins to take place around us. People begin to look at your life and they begin to say, well, what happened to him? What, 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 what happened to this guy? We have a, we have a kid as a great example of this. Um, back at home, we run gyms under this Genesis we had eight gyms around the country for boys in crisis situations. We take these gyms into areas where, where uh, the drugs and the gangs and, and it's dangerous and it's miserable and it's poverty and it's injustice all over the place. So I find an abandoned building and I have an agreement and rent with which and that they give me equipment that they have added to us. We're going to start these gyms out there. It's so cool to see these boys coming into these gyms. One day, a kid by the name of Brian came into the kid, this kid, and, uh, and he began to, to work out, and he was good. He was a little scabander, he, he had a criminal record, he was a drug addict, he was, he was just a kid from a nonsense. But over the course of time, Brian became a believer. Eventually, we employed Brian. He became Mr. South African, in fact, in his way to and he just became an unbelievable testimony in the community in which he lived. He didn't come out of the community, he stayed in that community. And whenever Brian Taylor would walk down the road, down the street, the kids would run out there. And they would just want to be with Brian, man. He's the man. Brian, how did you become who you are? And he never talked to them about going to church. He told them about Jesus. But the interesting thing about Brian was he never said a word. And even when you spoke to him, he was there like this and he would look at the floor. And he just was the most, most humble and nervous person in the world. He, he couldn't articulate anything. He couldn't, I don't think he could say, blah, blah, black sheep, baby, you walk. He would never do that. He was just a quiet individual. And yet his life spoke volumes into that community. It wasn't long before Brian had his influence being seen. All of a sudden, there were hundreds of kids coming to church. And we said, I did a baptismal service on the beach one day, because these kids are unchurched. So we put them in a bus, we baptized them in the sea. So 
So I took down 15 kids to the baptismal service on the beach, proud of people watching us from the church, and we had to baptize 12 of these kids. Anyway, every one of them had to give a testimony as to how he was became a believer. 12 out of 15 kids said we became a Christian because of Brian. And Brian is standing next to me. <laughs> It's what, you did. it's what you didn't say, Brian. It's your life. As the 12 out of 15 kids said, we became believers because we saw what Brian had done and we wanted to be just like him. And as a result of his worship, his public lifestyle of worship, 12 kids that day had committed their lives to Christ. Worship like that can be terribly authentic. So you ask, what does this worship look like in the world? Well, let me suggest a lifestyle of joy in the face of pain. A lot of pain out there. But when we meet pain, not with aggression and anger, although those can be legitimate emotions, but when, if it ends with a lifestyle of joy despite the pain, people will take notice of who you hang out with. When we show a lifestyle of peace amidst the storms of life, not that big as the whole time the world is in a storm right now. And when we Christians just add our negativity to the rest of the negativity, there's no difference between us and the world. Yeah, yeah. Christians, when we salt, when we light, when we minister words of peace and encouragement at the time of the storm, when people see that in their life, it's a good, when I preach in a sermon, that's a great testimony for evangelism. What about hope? In the presence of the enemy. What about love? In the presence of hatred. There is so much hatred around. But when we begin to love as Jesus wants us to love, watch what happens. The world does not need more servants. The normal world needs, the world needs more people who will live like this. And they are watching you. So let's go and prove it to the world that what we have is legitimate and true. Number seven. More than seven. Worship always is associated with the sacrifice. In the Old Testament, you never came to worship empty-handed. You never came to worship. You always bring a sacrifice with you. And it's the same today. Worship requires from us a sacrifice from our hands and also from our hearts. Worship requires and it always is associated with a sacrifice. In 1 Chronicles 21, David epitomizes this perfectly for us. David has messed up badly. He counted the troops. He thought, I could take on the Philistines. I am David. You know who I am. I'm a great warrior. I'm a great king. I'm a great soldier. Can't tell me troops I had, so I go, how many I could take out against the Philistines? And his general said, hey, David, we've never done that before. And David said, do what I say. I'm the, I'm the boss. You can count the troops. So the general goes out and he counts the troops. He comes back. David goes out to fight and it's a bit of a disaster. And then the prophet, Gad, comes to David and he says, David, you've messed up big time. You're taken away. You've touched the glory of God. And even if your name is David, you don't want to touch the glory of God. And so he says, you've got three choices. You've got three years of heaven, three years of three, three months of running for, for your enemy, or three days of plague. David says, I'd rather put my life into the hands of a compassionate God and choose the last one. Three days of plague. You agree with this? Great. As a result of the sin of David, 70,000 people lost their lives. That's the consequence of messing up. David is now a broken, broken man. And he says, I need to make right with God. I need to worship him again. So he goes and he finds a hill owned by a guy by the name of Aruna. And Aruna says to David, I'm going to give you the David says, No, I want to pay for the hill. Because I'll go and hunt off to God anything that is not cost me something. So Rudy said, Then I'll give it to you for free. I'll give you the altar for free. I'll even give you the sacrifice for free. And David says, No, I will not sacrifice to God that which has not cost me anything. Worship as a sacrifice is always going to cost you something. If it's by way of your hand, it's probably going to be something of your, of your time, your talent, your treasure. Time is a valued commodity. God requires that a sacrifice of your time, your best time, be given to God. Of your talents, your kids are so talented, for goodness sake. 
Don't think that you were given that talent for you. Not for you. It's for God. And God says, you offer to me your talent. And then he says, you offer to me your treasure out of that which you have heard. It's not for you. It's for the use of the kingdom. And that's a legitimate sacrifice that we offer to God. You always worship with a sacrifice in your hand and in your heart. And the worship of adoration to God is that which we seek to give to Him. Romans 12, you know the verse well, talks about this. It says, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. You don't have to die. You just have to offer yourself as a living sacrifice. And this is your reasonable act of worship. Worship is always associated with a sacrifice. Let me ask you quickly if we can put this under number nine if you like. Why won't we worship? Why wouldn't you want to worship? Well, the first thing is, if you won't worship the God who's too small. That's why David says, let's, let's we worship, let's magnify the Lord. Make him bigger in your heart, bigger in your mind, bigger in your expression of how much you love him. Make God bigger. And the reason that you will worship better is because your God is bigger. Our God is far too small. Our God is a God we want to understand. We're going to say, who thinks we can understand God? Who can, we, who can understand the Trinity? Anybody ever want to give that one? How do we understand the Trinity? It's like an ant walking across the floor here trying to understand how that computer at the back there works. He doesn't have the capacity to understand. And then he explains to you about how this thing works. And then he's going, I don't understand. It's exactly the same as we don't have the capacity to understand the magnitude of the Houston of who God is. So you can't make God big enough because your big enough will never be as big as he is. So make God bigger. Worship him legitimately. Your God is too small. The other reason that we don't worship God is because we're still in bondage to other gods with small cheese around us. Have a look at Moses in the, in the, in the, in the world of this with the children of Israel, and they're wandering around the wilderness, and the children of Israel are always looking back to Egypt, saying, hey man, let's go back there, because we had gods that we could understand, we had gods of food, we had gods of drink, we had gods of, at least we had a job there. Why don't we go back to the old line? Because they could not get rid, or cut themselves from the ties to the other gods out there. The pull of Egypt is just so strong, wanting to pull them back, to where they came from. He's a treasure character. In 2 Timothy 4.10, where Paul describes a man called Demas. And he writes this one sentence. He says, Demas has deserted me. He loves the things of the world too much. This is what I was saying. Number 10. Worship always begins with a choice. Begins with a choice. Elijah, 1 Kings 18, the top of Mount Carmel, had uh, won the competition against the prophets of Baal. God had come down with fire, consumed his offering, the prophets of Baal, they had cut themselves to shreds, they were bleeding to death. So Elijah put them out there as really kill them all, for him to put them in there. And then he, and then he, then he, he it's the most incredible thing, but he, he says to the people, How long will you go limping? Between two opinions. If Baal is God, go ahead and worship him. But if Jehovah is God, I suggest you worship him. It's a choice. It's an individual choice. You young people, you need to be first in this room. Worship of God will never be forced upon you. God will never, never, never force you to do this. He's given you free will and you will never violate. Freedom of choice that he's given to you. I hope that you make the right choice. That God will be the object of your worship. That God will be the objective of your life's worship of him. I really hope that that will be true. The other suggestion about worship is you could have do it today. Joshua said, in the 24, choose today who you will serve. If you're going to serve the foreign gods, do that. Serve Jehovah to choose today. Don't wait for tomorrow. Make a choice today that you will serve. Elijah said, How long will you 
whether between two opinions of love you must choose to say who you dread to be worship. So I need to put you today and ask you just to ponder these thoughts. Worship will continue long after all else has gone. We do know that. When we get to heaven one day, we will continue to worship. The only thing we're going to take out of this world today is the things that will give us reward and that will be worship in heaven like we've never had before. And worship will never cease, so you better get used to it right now. Your labor will finish. All your pain will finish. This church age will be finished. In Revelation 5, and we just close with this beautiful reading about worship that will go on into eternity. This is what John saw in vision. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousands upon ten thousands. They encircled the throne, and the living creature and the elders, and in a loud voice they sang, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth, wisdom and strength, and honor, and glory, and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and that is in the sea, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise, honor, and glory, and power, forever and ever. People bless the Lord. Forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders, the elders fell down and they worshipped. Father, we acknowledge today that you are God, you are way beyond our wildest dreams and expectations. You are far bigger and more magnificent than we could ever imagine. Lord, we've spoken a lot of stuff today. But I pray that even if just one or two of these little truths will just embed themselves in our hearts today, that I worship you, you would become bigger, you would become enlarged, and you would be magnified, and as you would above all be glorified, we are loved. Pray, Lord, that we would understand what it means to worship you so that our faith is a strength, that we would not worship you dependent upon our circumstances, that we wouldn't worship you were the wrong thing for the right reason, and we wouldn't worship the secular, the secular instead of the sacred. We'd bring them together in the one head. That, that our worship would be a great tool for evangelism in the world around us. And that we would not be afraid to bring a sacrifice. We would not hold back to you a sacrifice, because it's the sacrifice of praise and of our hands that makes our worship really legitimate. Thank you. The worship will continue. Way into eternity. We will never tire of it. So when you said to Satan, when you said to him, worship him, worship God, and worship him alone, you set the bar really high. And I pray that we would worship you more today than we did yesterday, but maybe not as much as we will tomorrow. Thank you.